Hello and welcome to Planet TV. Today we have a special event for you. We have the team over at Precursor Security who are going to talk to you about the current threat actors, their techniques and why the need is to move to a continuous security model. I'm not going to talk too much so I'm going to hand over to the team at Precursor and I'll see you at the end. Thanks for joining today. My name is Scott Cardo. I'm Managing Director at Precursor Security. Uh, I'm going to be joined today by Jordan Carter, who is one of our testers. What we ideally want from this webinar today is to give you some practical elements you can you can use, but also hopefully drive home a point that we see as a way security should be addressed. Uh, and this is it for it to be a continuous endeavour. Ultimately, at its basic level, your cyber security posture is seeking to prevent a successful attack against your organisation. So we all have to assume that we're all going to be attacked on an ongoing basis. And so we are kind of obligated then to make sure that we're thinking about security also as an ongoing continuous activity and not as it has been previously historically as a point in time exercise to be performed once per year, for example. So about us then. We at Precursor Security are an offensive security specialist. That basically means we're a penetration test specialists. Penetration testing is the method we use to evaluate the security of a system or a network, and we do that by simulating an attack by a malicious actor. We do this to identify attack vectors that could be used against you, vulnerabilities inherent in your applications and your defences, and also weaknesses in your security controls. The teams do this, uh, they use a variety of manual techniques which are performed by our CRT, our crushers, our testers. And these manual techniques are supplemented by some of our automated tool sets. In other words, we help you identify the weak spots in your security posture before the bad guys do the same thing and exploit them all. So we're a Crest registered company, member company. Uh, we are an IASME approved certifying body, so that means we can allocate cyber essential certifications to organisations if they want to undertake that accreditation and we feel they meet the standards. We ourselves, of course, are Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus accredited, and we're also nine, ISO 9001 and ISO 27001. So what we do, I don't propose to go through everything on that slide today, but suffice to say, most, most things security related, uh, we can undertake penetration testing, as I've mentioned, compliance testing. We do training, and you'll see on the right-hand side, Automation as well. The automation is something we are we are really keen on, and we'll talk about that later in the webinar uh, when we talk about CVM, CVIM. Okay, so the agenda today then. We're going to talk about who and why, and then a typical attack. And in this section, we're going to look at an example of the types of threat actors who are performing attacks against your organisations and why they do it. We'll see an example of a low-skilled attack which is actually pretty representative of the type of attack that you may be compromised by. And unfortunately, these are still proving really successful, at least from the perspective of a hacker. And we'll see a number of different points in that attack and that Jordan will talk about where we could have actually intervened and mitigated the impact. Then we're going to take a look at the evolution of ransomware. Ransomware has been around for a very long time. Most people have probably heard of it and quite familiar with it. But like most things in cybersecurity, it's, and I'll use the word again, continuously changing. We'll look at an example which is being used by some people who call themselves the Maze Crew. They've been making a lot of money attacking some really big organizations recently using an evolved ransomware attack pattern. Then we're going to look at another favorite method a hacker can use to get an initial foothold in the network, and that's phishing. And we'll also cover some useful mitigants against phishing. At this point, we thought it'd be good to give you a little hacking demo as well, so you can see phishing exploit from both the victims and also the hacker's perspective, interestingly. So all of this will then lead us into some good general mitigants that Jordan will talk about that we can apply, and we'll also touch on the topic of defence in depth. And then finally, we move into continuous security. We move into CVM, continuous vulnerability, identification management. We'll talk about why it's required, the advantages that gives us, and how it's reflected in a, in a typical annual security timeline for a company. So I'm going to hand over to Jordan now. Jordan Carter. Jordan is one of our testers and researchers. He's a CRT, a Crest Registered Tester, 
and there's a number of CVE credits to his name. So these are vulnerabilities he himself has found before anyone else. Uh, incidentally, some of these are vulnerabilities in security products. So it kind of reiterates that point about security um, requiring defence in depth. So I'm going to hand over to Jordan now. Jordan. Cheers, Scott. So before we dive in, I really want to take a minute to just get in the mindset of these attackers and look at sort of who's doing it and what they're doing and what their motives are and ultimately sort of what their end goal is. Uh, but when I talk about a traditional bad guy, like a tr traditional actor, not these state-backed actors, not anyone that's politically motivated, I'm talking about people like these guys. Uh, these are evil cops. These are the Russian hackers. They're wanted by the FBI. Uh, they said that around the end of 2019, they'd stolen a, well well over 100 million from the um, from company's bank accounts. And what they were doing is they were just deploying uh, Zeus um, bank intrusion and just emptying bank accounts through a network of money mules. But ultimately, what they wanted to do is they just wanted to drive around in nice cars and have lots of money. They didn't really care. As you can see, they were pretty brazen about it. Uh, if you look at the Lamborghini, its number plate translates from Russian to English to thief. So they really didn't care. They just wanted to get cash. And what they're doing is a typical low-skilled attack. And that kind of looks like this. And when I say a typical low-skilled attack, I mean, again, a 15-year-old or maybe uh, an unskilled actor that kind of just has read some stuff on the internet, kind of knows some stuff and does lots of noisy and lots of spray attacks that would be kind of easy to detect and quite easy to mitigate against. So what he does here is your actor in the top left, he starts off his day, he wakes up and he realises he wants to attack company X. Um, so in the example, precursorsecurity.com, he goes over to Google and he makes that search there at precursorsecurity.com. And what he's trying to find there is your email address schema. So there's a traditional few schemas we've all seen. First dot last, um, you know, first initial, last name, last name, first initial. There's a few common ones. So what he needs to do is he needs to find that. And they're relatively easy to find. You could find it for your own company if you went and did that search, most likely. But once he finds that, he goes over onto LinkedIn and he looks for your company name. And more importantly, he finds all of your employees' names. And he takes that massive list of names he's now got from one of his tools, his scripts, in a couple of minutes. And he puts them into the format that you've just found on Google earlier. So now he's got a list of what are probably valid email addresses for your company. He goes over to your company's um, 365 login, your OWA login, if you're still on-prem, and he just starts brute forcing accounts. He does a lot of traditional bad passwords that we see all the time. Password one, summer 2020, winter 2019, Monday one, all the traditional sort of service desk reset favorites. And he'll probably get an account eventually. And what he'll do then is he'll jump over onto your remote access solution because everyone's probably got one of them now in this current climate. We've all had to move to home working. So he goes over to your Citrix and he uses the credentials he's got from OWA to log into your Citrix. He sees there's a couple of applications published, um, kind of innocuous, but he opens one which is Excel and he knows Excel. He can use to open PowerShell. So he does that and he can then use that PowerShell prompt running in our internal domain because there are, no, um, there are pretty weak restrictions on the users. He then gets the complete domain user list and because he's a low-skilled attacker, you know, he just starts spraying. He um because he knows he's probably going to get another user because he's now got the full user list and not just the ones he found on LinkedIn. So he takes the users, he brute forces them, he gets an account. And because domains are domains and networks and networks and things change and mistakes are made all the time, he's probably going to realize that that new user is a local admin on a machine. So he can now pivot onto that box and start sort of running privileged things on that on that machine. And what he can do is he can run things like Cobalt Strike. Um, mimic hats, interpreter, and you can start to dump credentials from that box and, and again rinse and repeat and move around the network that way until he lands on a machine where he's got um, an administrator's set of credentials in memory, let's say. And um, so he scrapes those out of LSAS and he's now able to authenticate as an administrator. And once you're in a domain administrator, you're, it's effectively game over. He can pivot around your systems, he can exfiltrate your data. He can deploy his ransomware, he can sell your data, he can sell access to your systems and the like. But that there is just a look at a typical low-skilled attack that we see still time and time again. And one thing I really want to prove here with the red arrows and the orange arrows to a degree, the green arrows, is a lot of this stuff is easy to detect and mitigate against. And it's a series of failures that have made this attack chain possible and a series of control failures that have ultimately led to the, um, the impact being, you know, the ransomware or the data loss. So let's look at how ransomware is evolving. Traditionally, ransomware was, you know, send emails, see who you encrypt, get money. Um, it was a pretty idiot-proof system, and that's why it's proved so popular. But there are groups out there that are kind of pushing this a bit now, getting a bit more organized with it, and things are progressing a bit. And one of these groups is not Maze Crew. They're a used Maze ransomware, formerly known as Cha Cha Ransomware, but that's been around since around May 2019. Uh, and they're an incredibly active group right now. So 
the revolving ransomware past the traditional send email encrypt um, flow to more human operated deployment. They're using a combination of spreading techniques beyond email, which we'll take a look at in a second. Um, but most notably, they're also one of the first ransomware groups and kits to start using uh, exploit kits. So exploit kits were a thing, you know, they, they used to be popular back in the day and they kind of went out of fashion, but they're really coming back now for this. But we'll take a look at that in a second. Um, and they've also evolved in their general MO as a ransomware group, which has gone from the traditional infect encrypt extort now to include an exfiltration phase. And they're using that to, obviously they're exfiltrating the company's data before they encrypt it, but they're using that to leverage these companies into paying the ransom um, with the threat of releasing that data if they don't pay. And they've now got, they've got a website and everything where they post a wall of shame of people who haven't paid. Um, and there are some appearances on there and it, it's it's quite an active website. But notably recently, they've um, they've hit a couple of big targets, uh, a couple of high profile targets, including um, Cognizant. They made a press release a few days ago saying that they had um, been a victim to a maze ransomware attack. They employ 300,000 people. They're an IT services provider. So obviously their um, clients may have been impacted by that huge impact there, huge company. Um, the... Bank of Costa Rica, BCR, the Mays Group are claiming they've uh, hacked them and stolen about 11 million credit cards. And uh, Hammersmith Medicines Research there as well. They are a vaccine test center in the UK for Corona. Uh, they were recently hit by Mays as well. So as you can see, it's a really active group and um, they're pretty much doing this day in, day out. And they've got a few favorite methods of access. Um, and we're just going to take a look at those here. So phishing. Uh, if you follow Mitra attack techniques, they're specifically technique 1193. Um, they're throwing things around like Word document macros. I know it's 2020, but it still works. And that itself says we're still getting a lot of core um, basic things wrong. Um, they're also using exploit kits um, specific to Maze, Fallout, and Spevlo. Uh, they're targeting flash exploits. You can see the CVs for there. But again, Old exploits, um, but traditionally Flash isn't a patch thing. We'll just talk about that in a bit, in a bit more detail in a second. But finally, they're brute force and stuff. Fair Technique 1110, if you follow Mitra again, uh, mainly RDP. And again, that's all automated. What we can see here on the right, too, is that um, out of date Flash, um, things like that, and brute force and elite creds, they'd be caught by traditional pen testing and vulnerability scanning. Um, Especially the flash, the flash is something that's not centrally managed by W Sussman and you know you need some third party app management for that. And it's traditionally, I mean, we see it in networks time and time again, an often overlooked thing on at least a few networks. But on the left, the phishing, um, I want to talk about that a bit more because it is it is a complex problem. Um, and we call it a complex problem because there's the human element to it. So even with all the controls we still ideally need and all the controls that we have. The, the thing we need most for phishing is someone to just not take the bait because there's a good chance that if someone takes the bait um, an attacker is going to get access in some way to some capacity to some level to something you don't want them to have access to they might get a foothold and ultimately that foothold you know elevates itself as we've seen with current actors you know they might deploy um, cobalt strike and then just pivot up and deploy ransomware in your entire domain um, but really we're still susceptible in one way or another even with all those controls because again it's that human nature it's it's the human the desire to click things, to want things, and the attackers play on that because it is a honed con. And all that attacker needs is one person in your organization to take the bait and they're in. And you as a defender need to protect every user in your organization. So what we're going to do in a demo here is we're just going to show that even if you follow all the controls, if you follow all the advice, if an attacker really wants to, they're going to come at you and they're probably, there's a good chance they're going to get in. So again, we're going to bypass multi-factor authentication on an Office 365 account using phishing. So we've got the attacker screen on the left and the, um, the victim screen on the right. And what the victim's doing is they're going about their day to day. They've got an email from a partner company, let's say, and it says, here's a 2020 March financial report. Please click in, uh, log into OneDrive here to view it. So he goes ahead, clicks on that link. You know, he's, he's, he, it's his job. He works in finance. Let's say he's expecting that type of email from his one of his partner companies, one of his channel companies, let's say. But he goes ahead, as you would expect with a OneDrive document, he's got to log in at 365. He's followed all the advice. He's read all the stuff. He's got his two-factor enabled, and he thinks he is unhackable. But as you can see on the left here, the attacker is actually, with his phishing site, man in the middle in that entire process, including the two-factor authentication process. So as the user, as you can see in here, is receiving an official text off Microsoft with the code, he enters the, um, the code that is actually from Microsoft, and he's redirected back to his inbox by the attacker. He doesn't really know what's going on. He's a bit confused. But the attacker on the left here, as you can see in real time, he's now captured all of that authentication. And what you can see here is a cookie for that 365 instance. So if we just copy paste that, 
like this and copy that into our browser. We just import that as a cookie. We've, um, you know, these are just tools available on Chrome App Store. There's nothing, nothing special about them. And we just import that cookie. So now when we, uh, we do the office login, there we go. We're, uh, we're logged in as the victim. And just to prove that we're logged in as the victim, I'll, uh, I'll click in over here on the victim's account, test account. Um, and when this loads, I'll just click here. And there we go, test account on the attacker's machine. And that just proves how sort of how quick we need to start responding to things and how easy it is for an attacker to put himself in a position where he can continue further attacks. So he could, you know, he could start emailing IT admins, he could start emailing directives, he can look through OneDrive, he can start backdooring documents, he could search for things like VPN creds and stuff in the um in the mail, he can search for sensitive data. He really, even from this perspective, even if you are working to contain this now, there's a lot he could do in a short space of time. So hopefully that drills home really that we need to start getting on top of things. But obviously some quick wins against phishing. Um, some things we can do at low cost to really protect our organization. Number one, we need to create a dedicated phishing inbox. And that's like a centrally monitored location that um, your staff are encouraged to forward suspected emails to. And just so your IT team or your security team or whoever can um, do a bit of investigation and say, is this really a legitimate email or is it phishing? And if it is phishing, we need to move to some of the next steps. Um, so if it is phishing, maybe a couple of your users have reported it, but a couple have already received like a doc, doc X in, a, in an email and a couple might have clicked it while you're investigating. Ideally, we should be limiting the execution of those, um, those macro files, um, limiting their, their execution if they do get onto the machine and someone just happens to run them because humans are humans. Um, so you should be limiting stuff like Xs, docx, HTA files, you know, all the traditional phishing executables that we see today still. But let's say we've had a, an email and it's not had a document in there, it's not had a, an attachment, it's had a link to a, a phishing site that tells us to, you know, log in here to get your free voucher during this hard times for some food, courtesy of the company. So we want to restrict known sites. So someone's emailed that into our phishing inbox that is this legitimate, it seems a bit too good to be true, you've decided it isn't. You need to restrict that known site. So on whatever your gateway is, on whatever your, your boundary is, um, you need to be the web proxy or the firewall. Uh, you just need to kill access to that site um, to make sure that if any of your users do fall victim to it, they don't end up on that phishing site and end up putting their creds in or downloading anything or giving away any information. Um, things like Google Docs, if, if you need to use that site normally, try and restrict the full URL on your web proxy. That way you're just restricting that one phishing site as opposed to taking out the entire service for all your users. Um, but we need to restrict access one way or another because the four people that have told us they're going to maybe fall victim to it, you probably bet there are eight in the background that have already clicked it and are a bit nervous and don't want to tell you. But let's say we've done that, we've blocked it, we want to just get rid of that email from all our inboxes. Um, so, you know, in two weeks, we might re relax that firewall rule, especially if it was on Google Docs or something like that. But Kevin might have been on, uh, on leave for the last two weeks, he might have been on a nice holiday. I know how to, uh, to imagine in these times, but he might come back from leave, see that email in his inbox, click it, and we're right back to square one where we've got a victim falling fish into that email. So before that happens, we want to just purge that email from all of the user's inboxes. Once we've got a record of it and we've done a little bit of IR and we've got our paper trail, just get rid of it. And you can use the content search feature in 365, which a lot of users will be using nowadays, and just get rid of that email from all your users' inboxes. And really, again, the best way to protect against phishing, it's just the most proven way is we need to stop users clicking that link to really drive that home. We need to continue to conduct, uh, to conduct awareness training and we need to do a lot of phishing simulations. If your users are constantly thinking, oh, you know, once a quarter, I'm going to get a phishing email coming and they're kind of expecting it. They're going to be a lot more vigilant throughout the year, especially if they don't know when it's coming and they're going to be on top of things a lot more. And if you're encouraging them and you've got a good... Um, a good atmosphere in your company where you encourage them to to report these things to your phishing inbox instead of penalizing them for clicking the link then we can really start to beat these fishes but a bit more general advice from these groups um we need to start putting ourselves on the front foot not just against phishing but as we saw earlier against brute forcing against the myriad of attack techniques so i know you're sick of hearing about it but Multi-factor authentication is one of the best things you can do to stop the majority, like if not all of it, well, the majority of attacks. Microsoft themselves say it'll stop 99% of their, all the automated attacks they've been seeing. Um, but think about, I know there are business problems with enabling this. I know users are going to not like it. No one likes change. But if you can encourage, at least on your remote workers, on your remote accounts, on your admin accounts to enable MFA, you're going to put yourself in a lot better position if something starts to go wrong or if someone starts to attack you. Not only because it's harder to get in, but it's harder to elevate to other users. 
And obviously we need to start centralized logging. And we need to start centrally logging things and auditing and alerting and processing those logs. So no one cares about logs until they need them. When they need them, they don't really have them. And again, you can't detect anomalies like brute forces and weird logging patterns from users without logs, without collecting them, without processing them. And in 2020, you know, there's no real excuse not to be doing this. And um, if you are familiar with Elk, the Elk stack, uh, the Cabana, Cabana above 7.5, I think now comes with a seam, a basic seam module. It's actually pretty good if you've got nothing. Um, it will alert you on weird processes, user logging patterns and stuff like that. And it means if we're just centralizing it and processing it, we can start to act in real time instead of ending up straight in the disaster recovery phase. And all of this lends itself again to sort of defense in depth. And we'll touch on this a little bit more in a second, but ultimately one of your controls is probably going to be bypassed at some point. So we need to start thinking in a way that we need to introduce mutually supporting systems so that if one of those elements of our controls fails, there are other controls that will pick up actions um, that that actor takes following that um, that bypass. So, you know, everything from having AV and endpoint um, detection response on your, um, your workstation through to having IDS, to having web proxies, WAFs, seams, all of these tied together to give you that defense in depth and the overall picture of security. And we need to pen test things because we need to, we, we can't fix what we don't know is wrong. And you can bet the bad guys are looking for it and they're looking at it for it on mass in an automated way. When they find something that's worth sniffing around, they get manual and they start looking at things manually and obviously taking that compromise through as we saw earlier. But pen testing can help us identify these vulnerabilities that already exist, that the bad guys are taking um, advantage of and it's given them initial access and allow them to privilege escalate up by using the same techniques, using the same methods that they do. And we've got a solution to see them that Scott touched on earlier that we'll touch on again shortly, but that can help identify those vulnerabilities that still exist and those new vulnerabilities that are coming out between your traditional test cycles. And on top of all of this as well, there's no point talking about pen testing without talking about a remediation program and your patching so you need a regimented remediation program there's no point being told what's wrong and not fixing it because at that point you're well you are liable um, and i know it's hard though because testers will tell you all the time just patch things it's not hard just to update this thing just update that just update this on all of your workstations but on the other side of it no one wants to spend friday night rolling back a java install across an entire domain because you just took out the thick client used by half the company and the only excuse you've really got is oh well security told me to fix it that just creates friction and friction doesn't help anyone so we need a, a good test cycle we need to test and deploy test and deploy but we need to start closing that loop and doing that faster because the bad guys Again, their time to weaponization is getting really small. So again, touching on defense in depth, we need to assume that some part of our controls are gonna fail at some point. Um, and we need to think, okay, so how are we gonna detect and slow an actor moving through our assets after they bypass control X, Y, or Z? And touching on, again, another common, with pen, another common problem we see with penetration testing, people just focus on their external systems. They just think that, oh, well, if I necessarily scan my external for one day a year, then I'm secure and I've done all my checkbox exercises and everything's golden. That's not how it works. Is we're going to see security is a continuously moving target you've got to be on top of all the time. So don't just focus on your external systems. As we saw earlier, what happens when that actor lands on one of your machines is your build review, is your build securely built so he can't propagate from that machine he can't get his tools running on there is your firewall well built so he can't get back to his command and control center is your logging up to date so when he starts trying to, to do um failed logging requests you detect it we need to start thinking of our security as a layered approach not just our external and our traditional network boundary because with all the integration we're doing left right and center that traditional boundary is just really blurred so what I'm going to do anyway is I'm going to hand over to Scott now. Scott's going to take you a bit more through what we call what we need to think about. And we were saying that move to continuous security um, and how security is a constant moving target. And we just need to keep on top of it. Um, so I'll just hand over to Scott. Thanks, Jordan. We'll move on to continuous security now. And importantly, why that's a good idea. So the number of vulnerabilities per annum is really exponentially increasing. If you look at the numbers there for 2019 and quarter one 2020, we're already seeing that we're going to be way beyond any numbers we've seen before by the end of this year. The time attackers are taking to weaponize is decreasing and we really need to identify any low hanging fruit fast. Anything we can do to speed the time to remediate anything that we find and the, the time in which it takes us to actually find any vulnerabilities, we have to reduce. So pen testing is a point in time then. 
In the timeline, you can see this represents a typical example for an organization's security testing plan for, for 2020. But it is also actually really representative of our client we did work with uh, in 2018, wherein they had a major transformation program going on. They were putting a couple of new web apps live to handle high volume transactions uh, from the client base through the through these new websites to, to a massive database in the back end. The project itself was going great. Everything was green right up until three weeks from the go live date when they got us involved. Um, our team went in, we tested and we raised so many vulnerabilities that they actually had to cancel the go live date and basically replan the whole implementation itself. Now, this particular project had a run cost of about 75k per week and this was because we had multiple third party suppliers, contractors, etc. The delay itself was six weeks, so that multiplies to what? 450k, so fast approaching half a million pounds, which on top of any reputational impact on the programme as regards how the board viewed what they were doing. It was obviously a really painful example of treating security as a point in time and why that's a bad idea. The flaws didn't stop there either, unfortunately, as regards treating security in this way. We'll see now that even though they eventually went live and had remediated everything we found that was vulnerable, that very quickly, and I mean within days and weeks, there was zero days released, rendering the web apps vulnerable. Worse still, they had to implement performance improvements twice during the rest of the year. These were scheduled releases, but it was a third party developing the software, developing these web apps. And each time they deployed these to live, these minor releases, they unfortunately regressed their security posture. They added some really nice functionality, they upgraded and they, and they improved the website's performance, much more responsive, so all good. But the real issue from our perspective is, each time they did this, each time they went live with any kind of release, they regressed the security posture, they made themselves vulnerable again. So what we're seeing here is a really good example of why treating security as a point in time gives you a very limited view on your posture as regards a typical year. So to address this issue, we've developed a service called Continuous Vulnerability Identification Management, CVIM for short. And what you can see on the screen is the precursor portal. Now, this is this is where you as a client signing up to this CVM service would be given access and it's where all the results, everything you need to know from that service is stored uh, and visible to you. So CVM takes manual test skills from our CRT testers. It combines that with automated scanning. And then we triage these, these results and load them into the client portal you can see in front of you now. So as part of the solution, day in, day out, 365 days a year, we're looking at vulnerability scan results, we're looking at manual exploit validations, threat feeds, and various other sources of info that we at Precursor use on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we find something that we think you need to act upon, uh, then we'll get in touch via an agreed mechanism, be that SMS, phone call, email, however that alert happens. If there's something you need to act upon, with some vulnerability in your infrastructure and your estate, then we let you know. So when we combine CVIM to what previously happened into the previous type timeline, we come up with a new timeline, which is what you can see now. And this is what we want a yearly timeline to look like. So we have on the left hand side, we have the pen tests, internal and external, build reviews, all the other security elements that we can do. And that gives us a baseline, that gives us our starting point, a known position that we can move on from. Now in this timeline, Diffin says you'll see CVIM runs across the whole top of the timeline for the rest of the year. So you'll see that gives us, from our baseline, an ongoing continuous day in day out analysis of our position. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are zero days dropping in? Is there anything to be worried about? And if there is, you as a client will get to know. You'll also see on there that phishing is something that's revisited multiple times. It's such an important attack method um, to mitigate against. Jordan mentioned earlier. In the, in the case of phishing, the, the phishing campaigns change continually depending on what's happening in the world and what, what might be a good lure for a hacker. Currently, it's COVID-19, of course. And another reason to, to revisit phishing is that people join your organization and they may not have the same level of phishing awareness as the people who've been there for some time. So phishing is an ongoing activity. So how can we help? 
So for those clients of Planet IT uh, listening to this webinar, uh, Precursor can offer a free vulnerability scan. Uh, we'll keep that offer open from for 30 days from today. So if that's something you want to take advantage of, please do get in touch with your Planet IT um, account manager. Uh, and I would recommend it because it would give you a really good flavour of the kind of service you would get if you signed up for the Precursor CVIM. And consultancy and security testing, of course, um, this is our bread and butter. This is the stuff we do day in, day out. Pen testing, um, if you want Cyber Essential certification and you want to go through that process, we can do that. And mobile assessments, etc., etc. Anything in the security realm, uh, please do get in touch. Thank you to the team of Precursor for that really informative webinar. If you'd like more information, I would like to us to put you in contact with Precursor so we can talk about the services that both they and Planet Together can offer and get in contact with your Planet IT account manager. If you don't have an account manager, feel free to call the number on the screen and someone will help you out. Thank you very much and see you next time.